I am Reverend Cynthia Curtis, and I am here to talk to you today about uh, three health issues and uh, what's going on this month. This is the month of October 2022, and uh, I've chosen to speak with you today uh, in regards to, one, we all know that it's National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but did you also know that it is also uh, the month for National Domestic Violence Awareness. Uh, it is also the month for Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness. And so those are the three issues that I have taken to for this month. Uh, breast Cancer Awareness, we know they're wearing pink and powder blue. Uh, for Domestic Violence, they're wearing purple. And for Sudden Cardiac Arrest, it is red. And so for me, uh, two of those deal with the heart, so I decided to wear red. I wore purple uh, this uh, past Sunday. Uh, my uh, clergy shirt was purple, and so today I'm wearing red, and then uh, I will do a show for the breast cancer awareness, and I'll be wearing pink, uh, as well as my church on Sunday. And I know most churches have a praise in pink uh, Sunday. Uh, which is actually where I preached my first trial sermon was on a Praise and Pink Sunday, uh, almost maybe about five years, five or six years ago. So uh, for those of you who um, deal or have to deal or have had to deal with one of these, uh, I say, you know what, uh, do your research, know what's going on, but most of all, consult God. So we know that uh, for breast cancer, uh, breast cancer awareness, that it is estimated that 285,000 women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And 43,250 of those women are set uh, as part of statistics to die in this year, 2022. For the men with breast cancer, uh, there is an estimated estimation of 2,710 men that will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and 530 will die of the disease is what was estimated uh, by research uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, I would love to check up and find out where the numbers actually stand as we are here in October of this year, and maybe that's some research that I can try and find out for you all and get back. Uh, but I did a show uh, a couple years ago uh, called The Mother's Cry, and uh, we did a breast cancer awareness segment, and I brought on uh, the uh, regional director for um, Susan G. Coleman in Los Angeles, as well as a gentleman, KT, who goes by KT, but you all know him best from The Cosby Show as Little Kenny. And so... Uh, he doesn't use his name all the time because uh, he doesn't want people to approach him in that manner in regards to the breast cancer. But uh, I think that it was a great show. Uh, and I gave some word and we discussed breast cancer. We discussed uh, different events that were coming up and uh, allowed him to tell his story about how he found out uh, the day he found out that he had breast cancer and what was going through his mind. Uh, what he, his feelings were, how he was able to tell anybody, and uh, those are the things that play in the minds of men and women. And so uh, I know that people begin to worry when they're diagnosed with something, but I know someone who's a doctor that's not in the hospital. I know somebody that's a lawyer that's not in the courtroom. I know somebody that's a healer and a restorer and he is our creator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our God. And so uh, when we take a look at either one of these outcomes, um, when you go over to uh, domestic violence, uh, the national statistics for uh, domestic violence is 
that uh, the U.S. Department of Justice estimates that 1.3 million and 835,000, excuse me, 1.3 million women uh, and 835,000 men are victims of physical violence by a partner, a spouse, a wife, a husband every year. That means that every nine seconds, a woman in the United States is beaten or assaulted by a current uh, person in their life, uh, whether it's their spouse, whether it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Um, in uh, the United States, every nine seconds, a woman is beaten in the U.S. And so, uh, to me, uh, that's ludicrous. That is just, it's crazy to think that every time you breathe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, another woman has been beaten by a man or a woman or somebody uh, that they felt close to. And so uh, one out of four men are victims of some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. Okay, so whether that's uh, physical uh, abuse, emotional and physical, uh, someone throwing things at them, uh, it's something that needs to be looked at uh, which still plays into mental health. Uh, I don't care how you look at it, 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 goes, it speaks to the mental health of the individual that uh, has to fight their way when they don't get their way. And so uh, those are things that we have to take a look at uh, during the year to make sure that people are protected, that they are safe. Um, for years, people only think of women as being uh, the recipients of dom domestic violence but there are men as well who uh, have been abused uh, by women and others as now uh, people are journeying into other avenues of relationships. And so I myself even served on the court for a domestic violence case. And so I've had to see it firsthand uh, in many different uh, situations, um, whether in the courtroom, whether uh, with neighbors, uh, with family, I've seen it and uh, when it rears its ugly head, it's not only um, heart-wrenching, it's embarrassing, um, it, you know, to say the least, uh, when someone has to see that type of situation go forward. And so um, lastly, I wanted to just bring up the topic of the third issue um, of sudden cardiac arrest. Um, for the statistics here, sudden cardiac arrest is a leading cause of death in the United States, taking the lives of more than 356,000 people each year, including more than 23,000 youth under the age of 18. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest uh, is a life-threatening emergency, uh, and it happens when the heart just suddenly stops beating. Uh, it strikes people of all ages. So you have healthy people, you have adults, children, teens, uh, the person just unseemingly uh, collapses and uh, they don't respond or they're not breathing normal. And so uh, the three tips there uh, that um, I want to remind people or at least introduce to those that aren't aware of what sudden, car sudden cardiac arrest is, is that first, you're first and foremost, um, you're going to, of course, you see that person go down, you wanna check and say something, call out to that person, see if they're breathing, see if they're, they can speak. And then uh, if you see that the person is non-responsive, you wanna dial 911. That's your first and foremost, so you can get uh, help there uh, on, and on the way, get an ambulance coming on the way. Secondly, if you're CPR trained, uh, you want to begin to administer CPR. For those of you uh, that are not trained, uh, it is something that is worth your while to do uh, you can be anywhere. You can be out to dinner. You can be in a grocery store. You can be at a football game for your kids uh, or anything uh, at a movie and somebody go down and uh, they can't breathe. And so if you're able to administer CPR, you at least uh, have a chance at saving a life. You have a chance at bringing life back into that body because we know uh, literally you have only up to three to five minutes to get oxygen back into the brain and into the heart to keep it pumping before that person is gone. 
And so you want to be proactive instead of reactive. Uh, you want to know what to do in the time of need instead of uh, arguing with yourself about why you didn't go and take the class. And so it's a great option to be able to um, have already the skill of CPR and being able to help those around you that may need um, that assistance uh, at any time in life. And so, uh, again, it happens to children, it happens to teenagers, it happens to adults, old and young. And so uh, the third thing would be if you are trained uh, for AED, um, the defibrillator. And so uh, that is definitely training uh, that you want to have. Uh, it comes now with the CPR class. You can request it and uh, make sure that you have that. Now, I do want to give some differences uh, because people will ask, what's the difference in sudden cardiac arrest versus heart attack, a heart attack? And so I have pulled those uh, up here. Um, basically, the way it was showing on the chart that I pulled up, it says your sudden, sudden cardiac arrest is like an electrical. It, you're plugging it in, you're plugging, pulling it out. It's like it's something that happens quick. And so uh, the way they explain it, it says electrical malfunction causes the heart to suddenly and unexpectedly stop beating, okay? Uh, with a heart attack victim, there is normally blockage. So uh, they showed a little picture of a little plumbing guy with the plunger, and if you will. And so uh, the blockage is in the coronary arteries, interrupts blood flow to the heart. And so uh, for heart attack victims, it says it generally happens mostly to people over the age of 35, okay? And so uh, the person is responsive and breathing with a heart attack. However, with the sudden cardiac uh, arrest, uh, the person is unresponsive and not breathing. And uh, again, children, teens, adults uh, of all ages can have sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, with sudden cardiac arrest, the person may gasp or shake uh, as if they're having a seizure. And so uh, we know that uh, a seizure is different also, but um, a lot of people, you don't want to misdiagnose that either. You want to check a seizure if somebody's, uh, their eyes are rolling back in their head or their tongue is rolling back. You don't want to put your finger near their mouth or in their mouth because they could clench down and essentially bite your finger off. So you want to have something, uh, something metal or uh, something that they can't really bite into uh, that can cause them to crunch all the way down uh, for that, that you can kind of keep the tongue forward uh, so that they don't, one, even swallow their own tongue. Uh, two, if you look back over at the uh, heart attack, uh, the person uh, may experience uh, chest, neck, or uh, left arm pain, shortness of breath, sweating, or nausea. Uh, I remember an instance, I was in a church uh, in Orange County, and uh, Pastor, he had just came back, Samoan Pastor had just came back from Africa. And uh, I actually brought him on a talk show with me. Uh, did God say women couldn't preach in the pulpit? That's a whole other topic, you guys. But uh, I brought him on that show, um, and just before that, he came back from Africa and he collapsed in the pulpit. And so uh, I was late to church on that particular day. I don't know why, but uh, when I got there, uh, he was laying down on the pulpit and everybody was running around. Nobody knew what to do. And they were just calling and he wasn't, res he was responsive, but very lightly, he was short of breath. And so we began to ask him uh, questions. Uh, they were asking him, uh, did he need some water? Did he need this? And um, I, I asked him, I said, have you been checked for any diseases since you've been back? And uh, he was able to respond a little bit. And then I asked him, do you have pain in your legs? Do you have pain on your left side? I began to ask him these things. Uh, I asked someone to get a cool towel. I quickly ran and got my inhaler, uh, which is a fast acting inhaler, and uh, had him take the pumps to quickly open up his lungs. And so uh, while having somebody else call 911, uh, I began to, from his back, apply uh, a, like a, a pressure release, if you will, to kind of help the lungs breathe. 
And uh, by the time 911, the ambulance got there, um, they basically were saying that because he had had the inhaler, because uh, we had set him in the position and made sure that the air went back into his body, that it saved his life. And so uh, I, I am CPR trained, but we didn't even get a chance to do the CPR. I knew the inhaler would work faster than even the CPR. And so we were able to administer that way to him. So that might be something that you want to keep around. If you know someone has some issues with their heart, they have some blockage, uh, they have not gone to have surgery, or they're refusing to have surgery, uh, it may behoove them to keep an inhaler, a fast-acting inhaler, uh, albuterol, uh, something of that nature with them. And so just to go back on the other side, um, both uh, in this instance, whether it's sudden cardiac um, or it's uh, a heart attack, you want to have someone around you who knows CPR, who knows what to look for. Um, the same thing with stroke victims. I'm not going to go into that right now, but uh, there are different things that they talk about you should have for stroke. Maybe I'll do that next time. Um, I'll talk about stroke on the next show. But uh, you want to make sure that the person is responsive and that they understand you clearly, that they can speak when you're dealing with a heart attack victim. Okay, you want to make sure that uh, if they have any pain in their extremities, especially their left side, that they tell you. And so, um, because that's a, a sure sign of a heart attack. Uh, the, the flip side for cardiac uh, people uh, near you, again, you want to make sure someone is CPR trained. Uh, you want to check on the person uh, and see if you can bring them back because most of the time they're not responsive. So you're going to want to check for air. You're going to check for breathing from the nose. You're going to check for breathing from the mouth. And then you're going to check for a heartbeat on them. And then if you don't find any of those going, you want to definitely begin CPR. Okay. And so I just wanted to bring those two uh, forward to you. And then just to, um, for those who are AED trained, um, I don't want to go into that because that takes training. That is an area of training, special training. You need to know how to work the machine properly to apply the AED machine to the person, okay? Um, and then just to go back to uh, the domestic violence, um, the way we keep, the way we pe keep people from going through domestic violence is that we keep people joyful. We keep people happy. We keep people um, as understanding that love is first and foremost. Uh, our homes should be happy places, you know. Uh, most people uh, go home and they expect to receive love. They expect them to be places of love. They expect people to be there uh, that are family that will love on them. Uh, no one uh, seeks to go home to a person that's argumentative all the time or a person that can't control their anger, uh, a person that um, is violent, forceful, disrespectful, a person that wants to do harm, uh, a murderer, essentially, whether they murder your character, they murder your emotionally, you emotionally or physically try to harm you. And so uh, we know that domestic violence is a very se serious uh, mental situation. Um, people go through uh, domestic violence, uh, or should I say they, they, they latch out at people when they have low self-esteem, when uh, they're having major problems, when they're having mental breakdowns, when things didn't go the way they wanted them to go. And so uh, they begin to latch out at other people. They begin to belittle other people. And so uh, it, for some, it's a cycle of abuse. It's they saw their father do it uh, to their mother. And so then therefore they now do it to their wife and their children and it is a cycle that must be broken. Otherwise, it will just continue on throughout generations and generations and generations. And so um, it's very uh, dangerous when it happens. It's unexpected to the one that's receiving it. Um, it, it it's known that women are 70 times more likely to be killed uh, due to uh, domestic violence uh, of a partner, abusive partner, 
than anyone. And so there are a lot of different domestic violence intervention programs. And um, if you're ever in that situation, uh, what I can say is get out and get help. Uh, get information, go to your local library, uh, go to your local police station. Uh, if you don't feel you can enter the police station, maybe they're following you. Uh, get to a safe place, uh, go into a business and uh, write down a note to someone and say, you know, I'm being abused, uh, I'm being hurt physically, and hand them a note with a phone number that where they can contact you and or ask them to contact the authorities or place the address on there. Uh, if that person is with you, um, you know, there's several ways you can do that. Um, you can uh, put on the note for them to call 911 to the location where you're standing and then that way they can show up and question anyone in that space. Um, but definitely try to get assistance. Do not stay in a place of violence. Uh, violence begets violence. And so uh, you don't want to be in a place that is violent and um, abusive, and then it turns on you. Then you become the abusive because we know that hurt people hurt people. And so you don't want to pick up the ways of that person that is the abuser to you and then become abusive now to your children and pass it on. And that's how it becomes generational. So um, I say to many of you, um, some people have put up with it for many years because they wanted to stay in a relationship, because they felt like they needed a man, because they felt like they, uh, the family was watching and they didn't want to break up the family. They didn't want the kids to know. But I tell you this, children know whether you say something or not. Children know. Pets know. Uh, neighbors, they know. They hear. And so uh, whenever... Uh, you're in a situation where people don't respect you uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and they are harming your person. Uh, you take every means necessary to get out of that situation. I don't believe that God calls us to stay in a situation, uh, even a marriage, if someone is beating on you. And so uh, we were not made to be, beat, to be beaten on. We are not porcelain dolls. Uh, that you put on the shelf and then pull down to break off parts uh, and then put back until you're ready to do it all over again. And so whether it's a man or a woman, um, seek, seek help, seek uh, shelter somewhere else, seek uh, a professional that can assist you, uh, get counseling, get that other person to counseling if they uh, would be agreement, in agreement to getting counseling. And so uh, sometimes the person that is the abuser makes the other person feel guilty. And so know that uh, unless you, that, how can I say this and it not be taken wrong? That person could try and make you feel like you're the reason they're abusive. And there's never time that we should feel like it's our fault. If that person chooses to hit, that person is the abuser. And so maybe you said something, they didn't like what you said, but we all as adults should be in control of our behavior, not to hit. And so, um, again, I caution men and women, because men have been abused as well by women, and uh, a woman may throw something, a woman may uh, hit something, kick something, those are still uh, abusive situations. And so, again, it's a, if it's abuse to your person, you do not want to stay in that you want to pray consult God uh, in that situation and consult someone in counseling and uh, have a plan of exit. Uh, create a plan of exit, how you would exit that situation. Everyone's situation is different. Some people choose to stay, some people choose to go. And so uh, we want people to choose the safest uh, environment for themselves and, and their children. So. Um, you want to make sure that your children are always out of harm's way as well as yourself. Don't just move your children, but take care of yourself. Sometimes people take care of the kids and they don't take care of themselves. So just a note as far as that as well. And so um, as I was saying, this Sunday my church will be observing 
uh, breast cancer awareness and we will be standing in pink uh, this Sunday. Uh, many of you, um, whatever you choose to do, whether it's pink, purple, or red, uh, make sure that you are aware of what's going on and what's out there, what kind of programs are there. If you have somebody in your family that's dealing with uh, a sudden cardiac arrest or even a heart attack, um, make sure that you get the medical information that you need uh, and know where the closest hospital is uh, to your home uh, or your job, whichever, um, you know, in case something happens. And so it's always good to have phone numbers stored in your phone. It's always good to have that information in your car. It's always good to have, uh, we used to put under ICE, I-C-E in your phone, uh, it's emergency medical contact so that uh, they can find it and look up who would be the first point of contact if something happens to you. So uh, to those of you, I just want to give that out as a word. I didn't uh, put a scripture to this because I'm actually um, going to have a, a guest, hopefully she makes it in, and a domestic violence guest. Um, her name is Tanya Wright. So hopefully she will show up and we will be able to do the interview uh, for you all to hear firsthand the account of uh, someone who's been abused, someone who's been in a relationship uh, that um, took it to a level where it should never have gone, and then how she got out, what were her choices, how did she do it uh, for her and her children, and how God blessed her. And so uh, I will post those interviews later. I will try to have a breast cancer survivor this month. Uh, I will also try to have uh, a, if I can find someone who has experienced a heart attack or cardiac arrest, uh, and uh, just talk about um, how they felt, uh, what they were going through as it happened to them, uh, how God healed their bodies uh, at any point. And so um, I just wanted to come to you and talk to you and keep you aware of where we are in the month of October. What are the issues? What are we standing on? And of course, of course, of course, last but not least, voting. Voting is coming up. Voting, we're nearing November. So those of you who have not yet registered to vote, you want to do so, make sure that you are registered to vote. Hold on, wait for it. I'm going off camera. I'll be right back. So whether you are voting for the blue as Democrat, Hey, you guys like that nice switch? Uh, whether you're voting for blue as Democrat or you're voting for red as Republican, make sure you are registered. Make sure you know your polling place. Make sure you know the times that they're open and, that, that, and they close. Check your local libraries. Check your uh, local post office. They should have up-to-date information for you. Uh, know your candidates. Know what they stand for. Know the job that they have done for you. And so uh, I'm just trying to uh, let everyone, uh, make everyone be aware of the issues and what's going on this year, uh, what's going on this month, and what's going to reflect and change our new year. And so that's our votes. And so uh, in Georgia, the, the big uh, ticket is Stacey Abrams for governor. And so wait, wait for it, I have something you guys. Da, 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 da. I have my Stacey Abrams sign. So those of you who are voting for governor, I can't tell you who to vote for, but as Blake Sheldon does, he does this little thing and he holds it over the person. Um, I think she's really going to be the one to beat. I know polls and numbers are showing different right now, but uh, I tell you this after listening to her and watching her um, let me just see if I can pull up. Uh, we are definitely in a moment. My tab is not typing, you guys. There we go. 
Oh, I see what's happening. You guys want to hear what's funny? I'm typing on my laptop, and I'm looking on the regular computer. Nothing's happening, right? <laughs> see all right I don't know if you guys let's see if you guys can see that her picture that's Stacey Abrams there should probably move it a little closer um, and she's running for governor of Georgia and so there's her website stacyabrams.com so for those of you in Georgia vote 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 she's our girl okay and so um, all the rest of them, depending on what city you're in, uh, know who's running for mayor, know who's running for your city council, all of those different offices that are running, uh, your judges, whatever, uh, everyone that's coming in, all the incumbents that are there fighting to stay in position, um, just know who's doing what, know who is about it, who's about the business, who's going to do what they say they're going to do, and uh, I'm trying to get this hair out of my face, you guys. Um, and just make sure that your vote is ready. And so do not forget to vote because we know that if you don't vote, the next person will vote and we may wind up with, um, ha, let's see how quick I can get that in there and stop grabbing the wrong computer. Well, I'm not even gonna pull that up. Let's just say we know who our girl is Let's vote her in and let's get her in the place so we can cause change. Uh, something else I did want to talk to you. I'm going to throw this in. A lot of people aren't talking about it. I don't know who's going to be offended that I brought it up, who may be mad. But um, I had spoke to you guys on uh, the area, the issues with Bankhead versus Buckhead. And so uh, I have found out, maybe some of you guys know, some of you don't know, uh, that uh, da, 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 that Microsoft is moving into Bankhead. And uh, also Google will be is supposedly moving into Bankhead. So it might behoove some of you all to start researching, doing some research on that area because that's where all those houses are vacant. So I'm calling on the Tyler Perrys. I'm calling on TI. I know you got two houses over there already. Um, buy some land, buy some houses to make sure that we don't lose this area. And so, uh, there's many, many houses over there that are for sale or that are abandoned. And those of you who have money should do your due diligence to make sure that that area does not change. Uh, that is how I will say it. And so some of you pastors, you are there, your people are there, your members are there, your congregants are there. Make sure that those houses are secure for them so that they don't lose their place. There's a lot of gentrifying going on in Georgia. And uh, I can tell you this that if you guys don't fix it and stop it now, it's gonna wind up like California. And that's why many are moving here and have left California. And so um, I don't know um, hmm, what uh, our governor, Governor Gavin Newsom is uh, going to do, but it seems like things have just been full speed ahead. Changes have happened. Uh, they basically took over areas, uh, downtown LA, Crenshaw, um, I told them you need to go over there and gentrify Figueroa. It was a street that was non-productive to the community, but uh, it had not happened uh, before I decided to take vacation. So uh, at this point, um, this area that we're looking at of Bankhead is an area that's kind of like that area um, in uh, on Figueroa. It's non-productive. It doesn't have the right stores. Uh, it's not uh, well kept. The lawns are not manicured in the city areas, not, not the personal homes, the residential homes, but the city areas, the street lights, uh, the sidewalks, those things need to be taken care of. The, the streets have potholes. And so I don't know whose district that is, but you need to check on your district. You need to go out and check on that area and know why they left that stretch of Bankhead undone. And so uh, they put a new library, they put in new townhomes, uh, however you want to put that in, in a whole stretch of area and then they just stopped and they left an area non-productive so uh, take a look at that take a look at property for those of you who want to purchase those of you who need to purchase uh, to do something with that money those of you who have foundations and, and things like that um, do something go in there save the area 
Uh, those of you who have uh, lawn care services, go in there and offer your services because they need them. Those people need the help and many have lost their jobs and uh, let's try to keep them in their homes instead of creating more homeless on the street. And so uh, that would be the fourth cause. Uh, but for me, that's an all year long thing. I, I see people, I try to help people, I do what I can uh, with the little that I have. And so there are those of you who are famous, those of you who uh, have affluence and influence, um, you should be using that time to go over there and help the people. Get out into your community, find the areas, and uh, help uh, bring them up. Get to the libraries, get out there, meet the children, meet the students, get to some of the schools, and uh, go out there and find out what are the issues that are in the minds of the children. See what they have to wrestle with just trying to get to school. And so I think that if you get out and you see that, you're going to begin to want to help fix that. And so uh, that's where it came for, from for me. Um, when I was younger, um, I asked, how do people become homeless? And my father took me downtown Los Angeles. Uh, at that point, I believe it was only, your homeless was only between 2nd second, uh, second and 6th Street. And uh, there were people living in cardboard boxes. And um, I saw different men, I saw women out there. And um, it was just alarming even then to see that. And I asked my father to pull over and I, we pulled over and I asked one of the gentlemen, I said, how did you get out here? And uh, one gentleman told me that uh, his wife left him and that he was an alcoholic, he wouldn't stop dream drinking and she took the children. Uh, another gentleman told me he lost his job and he couldn't get another job. The job blackballed him. And so we have to begin to look at why are people out there? Not everyone is an alcoholic, not everyone is on drugs. Some people have just lost their way, some people have just lost their jobs, and some people have been blackballed out of their job where they can't get back up. They cannot get a job because of mean, arrogant people and uh, manipulative people. And so we have to learn to see through the stuff, see through the negatives, and allow those people to, be, to come back up as viable candidates in the community to be able to help them get a job, to be able to help them to uh, afford housing and food uh, so that there's not a food insecurity as well. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we need to also make sure that we have help for the men that are out there. I'm seeing a lot of programs for women with children, uh, for a handicap, uh, for mental health, but not for men. So we need to make sure that we have the programs to strengthen the men who we know are the backbones, who should be the backbones of the family. And therein lies the reasons that families are falling apart because the men are not in place. So if we can get the men back in place in those houses, I think that we can help situations uh, to become better as a family. And so uh, that's just my little rant today. But for those of you out there listening, um, find, an, find an issue that you're passionate about and begin to try and fix it. Uh, begin to look at it for what it is, go research it, see what you can do, get involved. You know, whether it's feeding the homeless, whether it's uh, going out to a, a domestic abuse shelter and just uh, offering uh, words of wisdom or uh, offering clothing if they need clothing, you know, uh, whatever it is. Uh, but we are called to take care of one another. Uh, the Bible says, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we are. And so we have to make sure that we take care of those who are less fortunate. God said to take care of the, the left, the lost, out, the least, the left out, and the lost. And so uh, that's what we are called to do as ministers. That's what we're called to do as leaders. That's what we should be doing in our community. If we see something going wrong with a neighbor, offer help. Offer help wherever you can. You know, um, if there's a child coming to school and you see they have no lunch, pack a second lunch for that child. Don't even ask, just offer it. Have your child take it to school and give it to them. They, I don't see anybody returning down, turning down food that hasn't had food. And so that is just uh, what has been on my mind and I wanted to come to you today again. Uh, but remember to register to vote. Make sure that you know who you're voting for. Can't tell you who, but know who you're voting for uh, in your city, your state, 
And uh, in this America, make sure that uh, you don't decide not to vote. That would be horrible. So we want to make sure that uh, all votes are counted. We want to make sure that all votes are handled fairly and completely. We don't want any of this runoff because they don't feel their votes were counted. Uh, get in and vote on time when voting, early voting starts and make sure you submit your ballot on time. And so with that said, um, I just want to remind you that the government at the end of the day is up on the shoulders of our Lord and Savior. It's up on his head. And so he is going to do as he sees fit and um, know that he will cover us no matter what happens. And so uh, we just have to be proactive in what we do to make sure we do our part uh, as citizens uh, in this country. So uh, remember, if you're at my church, we're your peak on Sunday, and I look forward to seeing you all. Have a blessed day.